Welcome back to Structures with Professor H. Today we're talking about gravity load systems and calculating tributary area and influence area. The gravity load system is responsible for carrying our loads due to gravity. So generally speaking, it's going to support some sort of floor or roof. Now, broadly speaking, we can categorize two types of gravity system. We have the one-way system or the two-way system. So if we look at a one-way system, we have joists that are directly supporting our deck or our floor. And then we have girders that support those joists and the girders are resting on top of columns. So if we look at the load path for a specific load, let's say I have a load placed right here, it's going to travel to its nearest joist and then travel down that joist, then down the girder, and finally down my column to my foundation. Now, if we look at a two-way system, our floor slab is directly supported on beams on all sides. And the beams are actually optional. You can have a system that's directly supported on columns. For example, a flat plate system made out of concrete. But regardless, the idea is that our load can now travel two ways or in two directions, both X direction and Y direction. So here, if I place load at that point, it will travel to the beam, then to my column and then down to the foundation. Whereas if I put load somewhere else, it will again travel to the closest beam to the columns and then down to my foundation. So effectively, I can divide my floor system up into four regions that tell me how much load each beam will collect from my floor. Now, this concept of collecting load over a floor area is critical to our definition of tributary area. So if we define tributary area, it is the area over which an element is collecting load from our floor system. And usually we denote this as A sub T. So let's do an example where we look at a typical interior joist right here. That joist is going to be collecting half the load to the west and half the load to the east. And therefore we have a total width of five foot and a span length of 24 foot for a tributary area of five by 24, 120 square feet. Likewise, we can look at a girder. So taking this girder, for example, it's going to collect half the area to the north and half the area to the south. If we look at our dimensions, we'll see that this is a 20 foot span and then we have 10 foot to the north and 12 foot to the south. Therefore, our area is 20 by 22 feet or 440 square feet. Finally, we'll look at this column up at the north edge of the building. If we draw our tributary area, it's going to include everything to the north because there's nothing else to the north that can collect that load and half of the distance to the south. So if we dimension this, we'll have six feet to the north. We'll have 12.5 feet to the south and a width of 20 feet. So therefore, this tributary area is 20 foot by 18.5 feet, which is 370 square feet. Now, a related concept is the influence area. And the influence area is the area over which if I remove that element, that beam or that column, that will be affected by its removal. It's not usually given its own term. Instead, it's some factor KLL multiplied by my tributary area. This factor is always going to be greater than one, meaning your influence area is always going to be greater than your tributary area. So therefore, looking at the influence area for our joist, it's also going to include the total distance until you get to the next supporting element, which in this case is your next joist. So in this case, our influence area is twice that of our tributary area. So our KLL factor is two. Now, the same thing will happen with our girder. Our influence area is going to be defined by this total area encompassed by the two north and south slabs to that girder. And therefore, once again, our influence area is twice that of the tributary area. So KLL of two. As for the influence area for the edge column, we can see it's this rectangle. And in this case, it's not twice as much as our tributary area. Instead, we'll have to calculate this. This is 40 feet in this direction and 31 feet in the north south direction. So calculating that influence area, it's 1240 square feet and dividing 1,240 square feet by the tributary area of 370 square feet, we come up with a KLL of 3.35. Now, if you look in ASCE 7, there will be a table that logs KLL factors for typical elements. You'll notice that that is always going to be a lower bound of the possible KLL factors that you can see for that type of element. It turns out that's conservative, and so you're always welcome to use those values directly from ASCE 7 rather than calculating it on your own. 
One place where this comes into play is in our live load reduction factor suggested in ASCE 7. So this factor allows you to reduce your live load if you have a very large tributary area or influence area. Now this equation uses our unadjusted live load and also the influence area given in square feet. So I will note that this equation is unique to square feet. There is a meter squared version also in ASCE 7 with different coefficients associated with it. Now please note that this reduction factor is only applicable if your influence area is greater than 400 square feet. So if you have an influence area less than 400 square feet, you do not get to use this term. Also note that you're not allowed to reduce your live load below 50% for any element that's collecting load from a single floor or below 40% if you're collecting load from two or more stories at once. So now let's consider an example problem where I calculate my factored loads for a typical interior joist right here and also a typical girder. For this example, I'm only going to consider dead loads plus live loads. For my dead loads, I have a floor self-weight, a joist self-weight, and a girder self-weight. And for my live loads, I also have a floor live load. Now, typically when we handle these problems, we'll compute our dead load and live loads independently, and then we'll combine them after the fact with our various load combinations. So let's look at our joist first. For the dead load, it carries itself, so its own self-weight is 80 pounds per foot, plus it carries some floor, and the floor has 60 pounds per square foot, and then I need to know how much floor it's carrying. So if I look at my tributary area for a typical joist, I can see that it's going to collect load over a width of five feet here. So because I have five feet that's traveling to my joist, my dead load is going to be the 60 pounds per square foot multiplied by a five foot width of floor. Taking all that together, we have 380 pounds per foot. Now, if I take a look at my unadjusted live load, I'm going to have 75 pounds per square foot, again, multiplied by that same width of five feet, and therefore this is 375 pounds per foot. Now, going down to the girder, we'll see that we have three joists that are supported by the girder, and we'll have two joists that are supported directly to the column, so I'm not going to consider those. Each of those joists is going to apply a point load to my girder, plus I can have some additional distributed load on this. So I'm going to have to consider distributed and point loads separately. Now, first, considering my distributed load, it carries its self-weight, which is 120 pounds per foot. Now, if we look at our point loads, we'll see that each point load encompasses an area defined by one half of the span of the joists, both to the north and to the south. So again, drawing out that area, we see it's a 22 foot by five foot area of load that is collected to a point right here. So therefore, each point load is going to be our floor weight, which is 60 pounds per square foot multiplied by the area, which is 22 by five feet, plus 22 feet of joist self weight, which is 80 pounds per square foot. So adding all that together, we get 8,360 pounds per point load. Now, if we look at our live load, there is no distributed load here. So we only need point loads. So L0 is going to be 75 pounds per square foot multiplied by the area over which it's being collected, which is 22 feet by five feet. And therefore that load is 8,250 pounds per point load. Now let's combine that load. And let's assume I have a load combination of 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live in this case. And the live can incorporate a live load reduction factor. So first we'll calculate our live load reduction factor for the joist. KLL we found was two and the tributary area was 120 square feet. So therefore our influence area is 240 square feet. That is less than 400 square feet. So we have no reduction. So now we can just directly apply our load combination. So U is 1.2 times the dead load, which was found to be 380 pounds per foot plus 1.6 times our live load, which was 375 pounds per foot to give us a final distributed load of 1,056 pounds per foot. Now let's repeat this for the girder. In this case, our influence area was 880 square foot, which is in fact greater than 400 square feet. So therefore we get to 
use a live load reduction factor. So let's calculate what that is. Our factor is going to be 0 0.25 plus 15 divided by the square root of 880 square feet. And that's approximately 0 0.756. So let's first calculate our distributed load. In this case, there was only dead load. So it was 1.2 times 120 pounds per linear foot plus no live load is 144 pounds per foot. Now for the point load, we have both a live and a dead component. So for our dead, it's 1.2 times 8,360 pounds plus 1.6 multiplied by my live load reduction factor of 0.756. And then the live load was 8,250 pounds. So taking all that together, we have about to three significant digits, 20,000 pounds per point load. So that is all for today for gravity load systems, tributary area, and influence area. I hope you learned something. Please subscribe, and I will see you next time.